what is the 4% rule for people that are unfamiliar with it? And when did this retirement concept become more mainstream or when did it come into inception? So the, the uh, 4% rule has been around since the early, early 1990s and it's called the 4% rule, but actually it's just someone's theory. It's not really a rule, um, but it's on how, how long your money will last in retirement based on how much you're taking out of that pot of money. And for decades, retirees have relied on this 4% rule to determine how much how much they can spend in retirement. So, but the the uh, inventor of that 4% rule now is saying, well, wait a minute, maybe not so fast. We might want to be rethinking the 4% rule in today's climate uh, and, and maybe take a more conservative approach. This longstanding method calls for spending 4% in your first year of retirement, but then adjusting for inflation uh, as you go forward in time. Well, that's good until you get into periods of inflation like we might be in right now. Why is the tax planning piece such a big missing piece of most people's financial plan? I think it's part of partly a big effect that uh, the brokerage side of our industry historically has focused on just that. Here's where you put your money. Here's where you can invest. Here's the rate of return to expect. Here's the rate of withdrawal to expect that's safe. We talked about the 4% rule. We've had all these long drawn, drawn out standards, but we're just now dealing, starting to deal with the baby boomers who are retiring as the first generation who's had this entire career cycle as the first people in, in history that have had this tax experiment of 401ks and IRAs and seeing how the actual outcome of this tax experiment in retirement is going to play out. So it's never been really, I don't think, forced upon our industry. And and I'm, I'm certainly thankful for the fact that we have our tax team on hand, but it brings up a lot of specific examples where we've had uh, a couple last week that had brought the same question to their uh, their existing advisor after they'd come to one of our tax classes saying, you know, is a Roth conversion right for me? And the advisor essentially said, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. You should talk to your tax guy. So they called the CPA who this advisor normally refers them to. And about three weeks later, they got a $300 bill from that CPA for a phone call. What fees can be associated with buying a stock like a single company specifically? Well, I'll, I'll keep it very simple in talking specifically about an actual stock purchase. So if you're working through a broker or some sort of brokerage firm, most often you're going to be looking at a, a transaction fee of some sort, $25, $50, $75, whatever that may be, depending on the platform that you're working with. So a lot of these online, online brokerage services you can go through and a lot of stock trading, fortunately for a lot of folks, is essentially free, free for the transaction. But you also have to understand that investing in a single company is going to have its own expenses long term. That comes at the expense of the risk. I mean, we've seen multiple companies that people in the past that people have purchased for the dividend payout. And, you know, these are long running, steady, consistent dividend paying companies that all of a sudden they cut their dividend. You know, aside from explaining the various Medicares that are out there and their choices, we also have to help them decide how, how do you plan this strategy and how do you plan the timing to do this? Because there's, for some people, they go on Medicare as they're approaching 65. They just they just do it at that time. But in this day and time, a lot of people work past age 65, and so they're on their group insurance until 67, 68, or whenever it is they finally decide to retire. And then there's a process that we, we need to take people through to get them to help them transition from that group insurance to Medicare. Circling back, though, to something we haven't addressed, her age. She says she's 40. Is that too early to start a state plan? Absolutely not. I mean, particularly when you're dealing with a business, you always want to have a succession plan because if you die with a business that it's operating and you are the main person operating it, what happens to that business? It just falls apart if you don't have a backup plan. So that's extremely important. And age is not a difference. What you have to do over time is adjust your plan to take into account the growth in your assets, the type of assets you acquire later on in life. But starting, it's never too early to start a estate plan. You know, we'll see this when people have a 401k with company stock. They don't liquidate the stock in a... Um, Oh, I just I uh, net unrealized uh, mm -hmm. a, yeah. uh, a transaction. They move the stock from their four hundred one k into a non qualified account, and then they have to pay tax on the the basis at ordinary tax rates. So if someone had had you know X number of bonds, they could just take a number of bonds worth what their their RMD is, move it to a non qualified account, keep the bonds. They've satisfied their RMD by taking the fair market value worth of those bonds out of the account or whatever asset it might be. 
But now you've got a tax bill you're going to have to deal with that you don't have the cash. Now I'm tracking with you. So you're holding the asset in kind. Exactly. And you're changing the tax status on Exactly. It. That's what you're saying. Exactly. That's different than what I was asking. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, you're okay. But see, again, that demonstrates right there. I was perceiving it one way. You were perceiving it another way. And had we not been collaborating and working together, who would have known what answer we would have arrived at? 